بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على النبي الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الله جل وعلا في قرآنه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بعد عود بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وسارعوا إلى مغفرة من ربكم وجنة عرضها السماوات والأرض وعدت للمتقين وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الصوم جنة وكما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم تسليما Do respect to our brothers honorable esteemed mothers and sisters listening at home السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته before we start, I'd like to pose you a question, just so we can, just so we understand that we are here to take benefit. Because many a time we sit in talks, and we sit in talks for entertainment, and we don't really feel we have a need to improve ourselves. We believe it very passively, that yes, I have to improve, but we don't really make an effort. So before we start, I'd like to pose a question for the sisters and mothers listening at home as well, and the brothers here. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we were to find out that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent the angel of death to take our soul right now, how many of us would be prepared to go? How many of us would be happy to go? If the answer to that question is not me, I need time to prepare, then why are we not preparing? If the answer is no, I'm not ready to die, then why aren't we preparing for death? Because the question, you know, the fact is very simple. We all have to die, correct? We all have to die. And we can die at any time, correct? So if the angel did come now, why aren't we prepared? Myself included, why aren't we prepared? Why can't we make our lives such that if the angel comes, we'll be happy to go? Like they say, al mawtu jisrun yusil al-habib ila al-habib. That mawt and death is a bridge. And it connects one Habib, one beloved to another beloved. Death is a bridge. It connects us to Allah. And mawt is a tuhfa. Mawt should be a gift for us. But whenever we hear about death, we're scared. We always need to change the topic. Why? Not because we're scared of death. It's because we're scared how we're going to die. Like ulama said that don't be scared of death. Don't be scared of death. Be afraid of the state you're going to die in. That's what's important. Because you're going to be afraid of death, nothing's going to happen. If you're afraid on the way you're going to die, then you'd improve yourself. So we all, we're all sitting here, we've all acknowledged that we have to improve, correct? We've all acknowledged that we have to make an improvement this Ramadan and even before Ramadan. Because we can't wait for a week till Ramadan. What if you have to die before that? And it's not strange, people die. You know, the angel of list, there's no, um, there's no list which says over 60s only. For over 50s only, go to the graveyard, you see 20 year olds, you see 25 year olds, you see 5 year olds in there. Mot has no set time, and Malakul Mot has no set time, and we can't say no to the angel of death. If he comes, he comes, and that's it. Let's make ourselves prepared. Inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon That all you who believe we have prescribed, meaning we have made farad upon you, the fasting of Ramadan, like we've done on the people before you. That's what was it. We know, we know keeping a fast is farad. And you see it's amazing. In Ramadan, even the people who are irreligious for 11 months of the year, when it comes to Ramadan, even they try to, they try to make a change. And the minimum everybody will do is fast. There's, there are very few Muslims in the world. There are about 95% of Muslims don't pray five times a day. But only about 5% of Muslims who don't fast every year. Everybody fasts. Which is amazing. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He mentions Ramadan how many times in the Quran? Once. Because He knows. I don't need to keep reminding my servants because they've got the message and everybody will keep their fasts. But when talking about taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions taqwa over 200 times in the Qur'an. Why? Because He knows we need a reminder. He knows we need a reminder. So Allah says, I've given you this month of Ramadan, 
And one of the purposes of this month of Ramadan is لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So you become conscious of Allah. You become God-fearing. And Shaykh Alama Yusuf bin Nuri rahmatullahi alayhi says something amazing. He says something so profound. He says, Ramzan me Allah Ta'ala wilayat ko muft me dete hai. That in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the door for people to become his friends. So we say, Alama, how did you reach this conclusion that in Ramadan, Allah opens the doors and everybody can become his friend? He says, look, in the Quran, Allah says, we have kept Ramadan and the fast of Ramadan farad on you, so you become conscious of Allah, so you become muttaqeen, so you adopt taqwa. And in another place in the Quran, Allah says, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَا اللَّهِ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Another place in the Quran, Allah says, those friends of Allah are those people who will have no sorrow, no regret, will not be sad. And Allah says, these are those who will have taqwa. So the friends of Allah are those who have taqwa. And in Ramadan, we are supposed to attain taqwa. So if we in Ramadan attain taqwa, then we will become the friends of Allah. It's so simple. And Ramadan is a training camp for 11 months of the year. Short example, when boxers train, boxers train, for, take any sports, when they train, do they train at, you know, full pelt? No, no, no. In training, it's... In boxing, they'll only spar with each other. They won't go into a 12 round fight, will they, in boxing? Same if you're fighting, if you're training up for the army, are they going to send you onto the live battlefield with live ammunition? No, no, they're going to give you examples. You have police academy training. They take you into homes, they take you into buildings and houses, and they won't have people there shooting at you. No, no, they'll have blow-up dolls or they have little poster boys and they'll have targets on them. So if you see him, you shoot him. So what do we understand? When we train, they take certain safety precautions and they make it easier in the training. Look how Allah has worked. Ramadan is our month of training. So Allah has made Ramadan easier for us. How has Allah made Ramadan easier for us? He's locked away shaitan. Throughout the entire year, we have two enemies. Shaitan is the enemy and our nafs is the enemy. But Ramadan is a training camp. So Allah says, Ramadan, I want you to become closer to me. So I make it easier for you. I lock one away, I lock shaitan away. So imagine, so in Ramadan, we're a tree. We see the true reflection of ourselves because there's no shaitan to influence us. Outside in the 11 months, we can have an excuse and say, it was shaitan. In this Ramadan, we have no excuse. So if a person doesn't rectify himself in Ramadan, then seriously, how much hope is there for him? Let's be honest. Let's be, let's, we talk about mercy of Allah. Of course, Allah is most merciful. But let's be real for a minute. You know, let's see reality. If somebody can't cope with his own nafs, when shaitan is locked away, then how much hope is there for him when shaitan comes back? Small example, I gave my children today in the madras, I gave them an example. I said, imagine you're playing football, 11 aside, but you play against a team of 6 players. And you lose against a team of 6 players. Then what hope do you have against a team of 11 players? So if we're failing in Ramadan, then what hope do we have outside of Ramadan? So Ramadan is a time where Allah wants us to become closer. How do we know that? Because Allah has made it easier for us by locking shaitan away. Ramadan is a month. Which is why in one hadith, Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala narrates, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was stood by the member. He stood on the first step, said, Ameen. Second step, Ameen. Third step, said, Ameen. And the sahaba was saying, you didn't make dua and you're just saying, Ameen. Who says, Ameen without making dua? Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no. Jibreel came to me. You couldn't see him, but Jibreel came to me. And when I climbed on the first step, Jibreel made a bad dua, not a good dua, a bad dua, a bad dua. And he said, may that person be wretched and wicked and may he be destroyed. That Ramadan comes upon him and he isn't forgiven. I said, Ameen. Think about this for a second. Who's making the dua? Jibreel, the greatest angel. And who's saying Ameen? Muhammad, the greatest prophet. Jibreel, the greatest angel, makes a dua. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the greatest prophet says, Ameen. Will this dua ever be rejected? And what's the dua? A person who does not make the most of Ramadan will be destroyed. Let's be real about this. That's what the dua is. We have, alhamdulillah, I'm saying alhamdulillah because it's difficult, but we get more reward inshallah. Our fasts are how long? 
18, 19 hour long fast. It's crazy. 18 hour fasts. Keep it any time throughout the year. It's impossible. In Ramadan, it becomes so easy. But this is our fast. We know. I'm going to eat this for Sahri. And I'm going to have this for Iftar. Correct? We know when we break our fast. We know when we start to fast. There are people around the world today. Who don't know when they're going to eat. It's true. We call it Fakre Ittirari and Fakre Ikhtiyari. Fakre Ikhtiyari is when you choose to be hungry. Like we are choosing to be hungry now. We can break our hunger anytime. Fakre Ittirari is when they have no choice. Allah has tested them. They have no choice. Ka'ab ibn Ujjah radiallahu ta'ala an once comes. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is said there. Oh Allah, you bring tears to your eyes. This is, remember, this is the greatest man to have ever stepped on this planet. Ka'ab ibn Ujjah radiallahu ta'ala an comes. And he sees Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's face, his, the color has changed. And he says, Ya Nabi Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mali Araka Mutagayyar alone. Oh Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the f- color on your face has changed. What's wrong, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He says, God, this stomach hasn't seen, this, these eyes haven't seen, and this stomach and this tongue hasn't tasted food for three days. He is Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, I haven't tasted food for three days. For three days. Can we live for three hours without snacking? Can we live for a day without snacking? Three days and he's the greatest man. That Jibreel comes and Jibreel says, you know the whole Mount Uhud? It's all gold for you if you want it. And he said, no, I don't want it to be gold. I live like a slave lives. As a Ka'b and then comes and he works and he brings him some dates. And he says, oh Ka'b. And Ka'b says, oh Nabi Sassim, I love you. He says, I love you, Nabi of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, watch out for what you say, watch your tongue. Because this statement and this claim of I love you is a very strong statement. And oh Ka'ab, you're saying this because you've said this. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests his anbiya the most. Then the people who love the anbiya will be tested the most. Be ready, be ready, be ready for poverty that will strike you and that will destroy you, O Ka'ab. This was faqr ikhtirari. And ours, ours is faqra ikhtiyari. We're choosing to go hungry. So the least, the most, the least we can do, the least we can do is make the most of these days. Are we going to let these days pass and be the same after 30 days? What's the point then? Seriously, what's the point of Ramadan? If come the day before Ramadan, we're the same. Come eat there and shaitan is released and we can see shaitan is released because people who had sharm in Ramadan become bay sharm and bay haya after Ramadan on the day of Eid. So we know shaitan has come out. So why don't we make a change to our life? Which is why I made a, I made a small checklist, which inshallah I'll give to whoever wants it after. The, and the reason why I've made this is so it's so practical advice in Ramadan, how we can make the most of our time in Ramadan. Because we see Ramadan, we have, alhamdulillah, we all have a boost in energy that yes, I want to do something. We all have this emotion, correct that yes, I want to make myself better. But we don't know what to do. We, this emotion just stays, it's a josh. And we don't know how to direct our josh in the best way. We have this passion. We don't know how do we direct this passion so we make the most of our Ramadan. Which is why I made this checklist. Coming back to the topic of taqwa. What is taqwa? A poet says taqwa, he explains taqwa so beautifully. He says, وَاصْنَعْ كَمَاشٍ فَوْقَ أَرْضِ الشَّوْكَةِ يَحْذَرُ مَا يَرَى لَا تَحْقِرَنَّ صَغِيرَةً إِنَّ الْجِبَالَ مِنَ الْحَصَى I have repeated this poem many times. And it's because the poem is so powerful. And it's a person giving advice to another person. He says, خَلِّ الذُّنُوبَ صَغِيرَهَا وَكَبِيرَهَا ذَاكَ التُّقَى Leave every type of sin, big or small. That's what you call taqwa. Think about it. In Ramadan, Outside of Ramadan is eating halal or haram. Are we allowed to eat? Of course we're allowed to eat. Are we allowed to drink outside of Ramadan? Yes, of course we're allowed to drink. Yet during these 18 hours of Ramadan, of the day, Allah makes what's halal outside Ramadan, haram inside Ramadan. He says, no, you can't eat and you can't drink. So imagine those things which were haram outside Ramadan. If halal became haram, then what is the status of those things which were haram outside Ramadan? How much of a haram does it become in Ramadan? Which is why the poet says, anything big or small, leave it. This is taqwa. And he says, how do you treat yourself? He says, imagine you're walking on a thorny path. How would you walk? 
you'd lift up your clothes. If you're wearing a thobe, a jubba like mine, you'd lift it up. You'd walk very carefully watching where you're going. He says, this is how you deal with Allah's rulings. Make sure you're very careful about falling into haram. There's ditches everywhere. There's stones everywhere. لا تحقرن صغيرة And he leaves a message that we should write with golden ink on our hearts. He says, لا تحقرن صغيرة Don't ever think of any sin too small. Don't ever underestimate the effect of a small sin. And he explains why. Why? إن الجبال من الحصى Because how are mountains made? Mountains are made by a collection and a gathering of small, small pebbles. Today it's small, small sins. Tomorrow, the day of Qiyamah, we think it's a small sin, small sin, small sin, small sin. Day of Qiyamah, we see a mountain. Where did this mountain come from? This mountain were the small deeds that kept building up. The small sins that kept building up. Let's not underestimate a small sin. In Ramadan, let's make an intention to change. Any small sin, we leave. Any small sin, we leave. We make this intention. Allah mentions the Ramadan. He mentions the word Ramadan once in the Quran. He talks about Ramadan explicitly in only six ayat of the Quran. I've mentioned this before. In only six ayat of six thousand and six hundred ayat, he only mentions it. How many ayat of the Quran? Only six. And Allah says in one of these ayat, Allah says, "وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ الْعِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ." Allah tells Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when my servants ask about me, tell them I am close. Now I want you to think, think. Allah doesn't say if my servants ask about me. Allah says when my servants ask about me. What's the difference between when and if? Somebody tell me the difference. It's an open mic. If, if, has a 50-50 chance of happening or not happening. If I go town tomorrow, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But when I say when, then it means I expect it to happen. When my child has gone to Madrasa, for example, my brother is in Darul Ulum, I'm not going to say if my brother comes back, because I expect him to come back. So I say, when my brother comes back, Allah says, when my servants ask about me, which means Allah is expecting us to ask Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or Allah expected the Sahaba to ask Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When my servants ask about me, how should you reply? Inni qareeb. And this inni qareeb is fascinating. I'll tell you why. Allah doesn't say, Inna Allah qareeb, Inna hu qareeb. Allah doesn't speak in the third person. Allah doesn't say, He is close, or Allah is close. Allah says, No, me, 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 I am close. Tell them I am close. And Allah has an individual relationship with every single person. And I explained taqwa using this ayah. If you are sat with your friends, and it's bayt takallufi, meaning it's a very informal gathering, you know, maybe you're swearing, cursing, you're backbiting, you're doing bad things, listening to music, Allah save us, you're doing all these bad things. And your father walks in. Your father walks in, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Everyone becomes straight, everyone closes, everyone shuts their mouth, correct? Or when you're driving, you're driving on a motorway 9,500 miles an hour and you see a police car about 200 meters away, what are you going to do? Inni qareeb, the police is saying, I'm close, what are you going to do? You're going to slow down. So this is what Allah is trying to say. Allah says, whenever they think of sinning, tell them, I am close. So in the same way, we change our attitude when somebody is far and when somebody is close. Allah says, I'm forever close. I'm forever close. So why do you treat me like I'm far away? If you have so much sharam, so much haya and so much shame that you won't sin in front of your father, then why don't we have shame that we sin in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then Allah says, Ujibu da'an. Allah says, I accept. And I reply to the dua of those who make dua and who call upon me. Allah says, I reply. Let's see the relationship between Allah and His servant. Is there a greater status in the world anybody could have than being the Rabb and the Lord and the owner of the universe? Can there be anybody higher? No, there can't be anybody higher. So Allah is the Almighty, the highest of the high. And normally in a business model, in a hierarchy, who is the lowest? You'll have the janitor maybe. You'll have the cleaner. But trust me, there's nobody lower than the slave. Is there anybody with a lower status in the world than a slave? 
No. So the slave is the lowest and Rabbul Alameen is the highest. Now imagine you're working. You're working, there's a CEO of a company, he has 600 people under him. And you're somewhere, you may be on the third level, he doesn't even know your name. He comes past you one day in the office and he, ta- he takes your name and you've, he took my name today. You feel so tough, the manager took my name. I feel so happy. But there's not, much, there's not a big gap between you, only two, three stages. Let's see our relationship with Allah. We are the lowest of the low and Allah is the highest of the high. Allah doesn't say book an appointment with me. Allah says no, call upon me anytime, I'll reply to you anytime. And Allah doesn't say, Ujibu dua ad da'i. What's the word for dua in Arabic? Dua. It's the same word, dua. Allah doesn't use the word dua, I reply to their dua. Allah uses the word da'wah. What does da'wah mean? Da'wah means somebody who makes dua once. Allah says, even if you make dua once and you call out once to me, I'll reply to you. Why aren't we calling out to Allah? Why aren't we calling out to Allah? And what comes later is even more amazing. Fal yastajibuli. Allah says, I'll give you everything. All I want you to do is try. Allah doesn't say, give me 100%. Allah says, try. Try. Well, you, minubi, you try and have faith in me. Do, th- do things. Put in the effort, have faith in me. Allah says, I'll do the rest. I will guide you. This is Allah re- Allah's relationship with us. Let's make the most of Ramadan and take advantage of this relationship. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down to the lowest heaven. And he calls out, who wants their forgiveness done? Allah says, I'll forgive you. Whoever wants forgiveness, I'll forgive you. I'll give you one example of taqwa, one example. We've heard of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and the second khalif. Yes? Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala was one day passing by a garden. And behind the wall, he heard a mother talking to her daughter. And she was telling her daughter that we have milk to sell. But for example, we have a hundred orders, but the milk in the pot is only for 50 people. So what we do is, we'll add water into it, mix it together, so it caters for a hundred people. And the daughter says, no, we can't do that. You know, we can't do it. It's lying. And her mother says, but Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar radiallahu ta'ala isn't here to see us. And Umar is listening to this on the other side of the wall. And the mother says, no, Umar isn't listening to us. What does the daughter say? Who cares if Umar isn't listening to us? The Lord of Umar is listening to us and watching us. The Lord of Umar is listening to us and watching us. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala next day went away. Next day he comes back and he took, he found out, he says, who is this house? He got the daughter married to his son, the grandchildren of whom created the great, great scholar of Islam, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Alayhi, he was known as the fifth Khalif of Islam. One of the greatest men of his time. He was known as the reviver and the mujaddid of the first century of Islam. He revived Islam. After the, after the four Khalifs passed away, after Hazrat Ali passed away, Islam went down. Hazrat Umar Aziz came and he resurrected Islam. And he was a produce of this pious woman and this pious man, Hazrat Umar son. This is taqwa, knowing Allah is everywhere. And making our life such. And Ramadan even more so. We should become close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I've made this checklist. And I'll just run through the checklist very, very fast. Inshallah, I've made 1100 copies. And again, I'd like to thank those people who helped, with, who helped me. I went to a few ulama, I made this, went to a few. It's not perfect because I myself made a few changes. There's, that's a, I've got the, perf, the copy now. But for next year, I've added in a few changes. And um, inshallah we'll get that copy. I made 1100 copies to go around Gloucester. Alhamdulillah it's gone on social media. Other people are taking use of it. And all those who participated, friends and family, make dua to you. And we can participate as well. How can we participate with this? By doing amal upon it. By using it to take doing action. It's those things. It's how, like I said, we, we have this passion in Ramadan. But we don't know how to direct our passion, do we? So this is inshallah will help us direct our passion. And we also need people tomorrow who can hand it out. We'll talk about that later, inshallah. So the first thing, I've made daily activities. And in there I've mentioned we have said it before time. That's obvious, inshallah, we should all do it. Tick it off. We pray Fajr and two rakats of Sunnah for Fajr. Alhamdulillah in Ramadan. In Ramadan, Alhamdulillah. Even though Fajr is the earliest in the year, we pray, Ramadan, we pray Fajr every day. 
And don't be so lazy. If we're going to stay awake all night, the least we can do is come to the masjid. Alhamdulillah, namaz in two masajah. Ten minutes after sahri ends, namaz, jama'at will start. The, mas- the masajid have made it very easy for us. And it comes in a hadith, the person who comes to fajr. The person who reads isha with jama'ah, and the person who prays fajr with jama'ah, is as if he has stood up, he stood up all night in worship. Just by reading two salah with jama'ah, so easy. Especially in Ramadan. And a person who comes to Fajr has the flag of Islam, is bearing the flag of Islam in his hand. So let's be those who bear the flag of Islam. Pray Fajr with Jama'ah. We can take that off. We should do our morning adhkar. I've written morning dhikr. Morning dhikr consists of we do istighfar, first kalima, third kalima, and durood sharif daily. Hundred times in the morning, hundred times in the evening, Allah says in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillah tatma'inu al Don't go running right, don't go running left, don't go to this lawyer, this psychologist, this psychiatrist. Do you want peace of your heart? It's not in money, it's not in wealth, it's not in businesses. Peace of your heart is in remembering Allah. Ramadan, let's make this time to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's make our tongues moist with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every subhanallah we pray, a tree is being planted in Jannah. Today, I, w- I don't want to see my Jannah today. Why? Because I'm going to see it, I'll probably think, you know, I could have done so much more. I could have done so much more. So we've got, subhan- right now, you could sit here and just pray subhanallah in your minds. Just pray subhanallah, you're getting rewarded every time. So alhamdulillah, morning dhikr we should do inshallah. I've written, we pray salah on time, and with the sunnahs, inshallah we should all do it. Those who don't work, so long and they can't take time to pray every salah in the masjid please pray your salah. even at work try to pray your salah in jama'ah Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi writing his Ihya Ulum al-Din he said Imam Ghazali was amazing Imam Ghazali wrote he wrote there are people of the past who when they missed takbir ula just the start of salah they came with the jama'ah but they just missed the first takbir and they joined slightly late in jama'ah he says these people would mourn and cry for three days for three days. And he says, I've seen people who have missed their jama'ah. They've prayed their salah, but they've missed jama'ah. They came ten minutes late and they missed jama'ah. He said they would cry in sorrow for seven days. For missing salah with jama'ah. Ibn Khuzayma rahmatullah is a great muhaddith. He says if somebody doesn't pray salah with jama'ah, his salah doesn't even count. This is the importance of praying salah with jama'ah, especially in Ramadan. Especially in Ramadan. Which is why we see... Even in war, even on the battlefield, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made rules. That even on the battlefield, when the enemy is active, not when it's passive and everyone is sleeping, even when you're in combat with the enemy, Allah says, don't forsake salah with jama'at. Half of the army plays salah with jama'at, the other half fight. When they finish, the second half plays salah with jama'at and the first half fight. Even on the battlefield, what excuse do we have today? Today we're not fighting a war with the enemy, we're fighting a war with our nafs. In Ramadan it's not a war with shaitan, it's a war with ourselves. Like Alama Sa'di used to say, that to enter Jannah is simple, it's two steps. Actually he says the second step is in Jannah. He says the first step is stepping on your nafs, step on your ego, step on your pride. And he goes, second step you'll be in Jannah. This is how easy it is, but we have to make this conscious effort. I've written du'as and tasbihat after every salah. We should know these tasbihat after every salah. Astaghfirullah. Alhamdulillah. In our masjid, masjid Umar, where we put the shoes, we have a banner, we have a poster telling you which tasbihat to pray. Ramadan is a time to learn. Let's learn. That's also coming, inshallah. We should learn these du'as in Ramadan and make it after every salah. It becomes, after 30 days, it becomes a habit. So after 30 days, like I said, Ramadan is a training camp. So we should do what we're doing in Ramadan, also outside of Ramadan. It'll become a training camp. We'll do it after Ramadan as well, inshallah. Surah Yasin in the morning comes in a hadith. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Whoever prays Surah Yasin in the morning and in the evening, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will guarantee his forgiveness. That's simple. What? Surah Yasin in the morning? Surah Yasin in the evening. It takes how long? For Hufad, it'll take 3-4 minutes. For a non hafiz 10 minutes, 15 minutes. For your forgiveness, you can't give 10-15 minutes? Let's give it 10-15 minutes. Allah will forgive us. Allah promises. Just have faith in Allah. Allah will do it. Next I've written, pray chash salah. We pray salah before midday. It also comes in hadith. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will pray salah before midday. Dua before iftar. 
The dua of a person who is fasting will never be rejected. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, hina yuftir la turad And it, in fact, in the hadith, he says, As-sa'im hina yuftir. Not just any fasting person. He says, the fasting person who keeps his fast and who makes dua just before iftar is, he'll, ta- he'll partake in iftar. Allah will accept his dua. Why? Let's think about the time. We'll be sat in front of the dasar khan, in front of the dining table, in front of the food. We could eat that food, couldn't we? What's stopping us from eating that food? What's stopping us? The fear of Allah. And hope that Allah will reward us for staying away from the food. Allah says, you have so much hope in me. Make a dua, I'll accept it. You're doing it. Remember, this is quite amazing actually. You know, every, every deed we do, we could do it for, to show off. When we pray salah, for example, we all do it. When a big sheikh comes, like if my teacher comes, and I pray, I pray salah next to him, my salah from going from a two-minute salah will become a ten-minute salah. It happens to everybody. But psalm and keeping a fast is one thing where a person, when he keeps it, he can't do it for sure. It is only for Allah. It's only and only for Allah, which is why Allah, when rewarding him, Says, I won't give you a reward of 25, 27 times like Salah. He goes, No. Allah says, Wa ana ajzi bihi. Allah says, Bighayr hisab. Allah says, Without any. Allah says, I won't care. I'll just give and give and give and give. And Allah says, I myself will sort you out on the day of Qiyamah. You don't worry about it. Why can't we? Why can't it be done to show off? Because there is, even for 10 seconds in the day, we are going to be alone. So the reason why we won't eat or drink when we're alone is why? Just because of Allah. Example, when I use the bathroom. Every bathroom has a sink, correct? Is anybody in the bathroom with me? I hope not. Nobody will be in the bathroom with you. I could drink water when I'm in the bathroom. Who's stopping me? Who's going to see me? Only Allah. So I'm not drinking this water, not because of my mother, my father, my brothers and my sisters. I'm not drinking this water because of Allah. And Allah says, because of this, I'll sort you out with the reward. So amazing. I've written, after Awabin, we have a habit. We eat so much at iftar time. We can't even stand up for maghrib. And come isha time, the stuffs and the masjid is stinking. Because everybody is burping. And we miss our nawafil between maghrib and isha. I mentioned this before, just in a small halaqa. That the reward for praying six rakats of nafil salah after maghrib kul awabin salah is you are rewarded for 12 years worth of worship. And this is a no made up hadith. This hadith comes in Tirmidhi. Imam Tirmidhi has the fourth greatest collection of hadith ever. He narrates his hadith from Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That doesn't mean we pray two sunnah after maghrib, then six. No, he's made it easy for us. Pray two sunnah, then four. Six all together after Maghrib. You'll get reward of how much? Twelve years worth of worship. It'll take an extra four minutes. If your salah is fast like mine, an extra three minutes. That's it, three minutes. Allah has opened the doors, let's take it. Allah has opened doors for His treasures, let's take from His treasures. So in just one year we have to make, definitely. That we won't miss our awabin after Maghrib. Just add an extra four rakats on. Your food can wait. The food isn't going to run away. It's not going to go anywhere. The food can wait. Okay? Then Surah Sajda in the evening. And Surah Mulk in the evening. Alif Lamim Sajda 21st para. Every evening we should pray. Surah Mulk. Tabarak al bi al Mulk. 29th para. First Surah. Every evening we should pray. And there's amazing hadith in Mishkat. You know, all these, there's so much fadilat. If we just knew about these rewards, we'll be, inshallah, we'll be doing it every day, even after Ramadan. Khalid al-Ma'la radiallahu ta'ala and says, a person who has been sinful will go into his grave. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to punish him. And we set the snakes, the scorpions, and the angels on him and say, punish him. And Khalid al-Ma'la radiallahu ta'ala narrates from Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly in a hadith in Mishkat. Not any, not any old book of hadith. A, had, a hadith in the book Mishkat al-Masabi, one of the greatest collections of hadith. And he says, Surah Sajda, the surah he used to pray all the time. So he was sinful, but he used to pray Surah Sajda and Surah Mulk all the time. He says, these two surahs, Surah Sajda and Surah Mulk, will come in the form of a bird or an angel. And they protect him. And they say, Allah, don't punish him. Allah, don't punish him. And Allah will say, no, get out of the way. 
And they say, and Surah Sajra and Surah Mulk will come in the form of these angels, these birds, and will say, Allah, if you want to punish him, then take us out of your Qur'an. Allah, if you agree I was part of your Qur'an and I am from your words, then Allah, keep Allah because of me, protect him Allah. Because of me, protect him O Allah and save him. And give him the escape route. And Allah will accept the plea of this Surah Sajra and of Surah Mulk, Allah will forgive him. Why? The person was sinful, but he prayed Surah Sajda and Surah Mul. Like I said, these hadiths are unfabricated. You know, we have a habit wherever we go to hear hadith that we've never heard of before. I've done my research. This hadith comes in Mishkatul Masabih. We've studied it. Next one. So, inshallah, every night, Surah Sajda, Surah Mulk. Surah Yasin, we've said already. Every morning and every evening, and the reward for Surah Yasin is your forgiveness is guaranteed. Forgiveness is guaranteed. Every night we pray 20 rakat tarawih, inshallah, alhamdulillah, most of us, the kid, children is difficult, but 20 rakat tarawih, we do it, Rasulullah, alhamdulillah, most of us are part of it. And I'm saying 20 rakat tarawih for a reason. We're not ghair muqallideen, we're not salafis, we don't pray 8 rakat tarawih, we pray 20 rakat tarawih. The ummah for 1400 years has been praying 20 rakat tarawih. Don't come 1300 years after Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tell me, oh, now we're praying 8 rakat of tarawih. So what, the 1300 years before were wrong? Everybody before you were wrong. And the entire ummah today, apart from this small sector praying 20 rakats of tarawih, Haramain Sharifain, till today, Makkah, Medina, 20 rakats of tarawih. We pray 20 rakats of tarawih, not 8 rakats of tarawih. 20 rakats of tarawih. That was one. And one hadith, I remember just now, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Man qama ramadana imanu wa ahtisaban ghufra lahu ma taqadr min dhambi. Whoever stands in the month of Ramadan, in the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive whatever sins he's done. Again, what is it? Forgiveness. Allah is giving us so much. He's given us so many avenues for forgiveness. Let's take them. We can say, if I do one, then maybe Allah will, maybe Allah won't. But if we do ten things, and for all ten, Allah promises forgiveness, then for one, Allah will at least forgive us. At least for one, Allah, Allah, is, Allah, Allah hasn't created us to punish us. Allah has created us to test us, then to forgive us. Let's pass this test. Let's take the forgiveness of Allah. I'll try to wrap it up inshallah. We pray tahajjud four rakats inshallah. Before sahri, we pray four rakats tahajjud. Again, three minutes. Just three minutes. Every night. We pray tahajjud inshallah. Our dua will be accepted. We'll be from among those. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, muttaqin. What did I say about taqwa? Allah mentions taqwa how many times in the Quran? Over 200 times. Allah says, Inna al muttaqina fi jannati wa na'im, fi jannati wa ayun. They will be in an amazing jannat. They will see springs and streams gushing forth. And Allah describes the people who are muttaqin. Allah says, Wa bil asharihum yastaghfirun. And come the latter portion of the night. You know, we say sahri. So Allah says, Wa bil ashari. At the time of sahri, Allah says, they do istighfar and they stand in tahajjud to their Lord. Let's be part of this. Let's be part of the muttaqeen. You are friends of Allah. You will be in Jannah, inshallah. Evening zikr, same as the morning. Istighfar, first kalima, third kalima. Duru Sharif. We don't have to learn all this by heart. I'll give this checklist out if you want it. No one's going to force you to take it. But inshallah, if you take it, I'll be rewarded. You'll be rewarded, inshallah. Then I've written, memorize a surah every day or an ayah of the Quran. You know Ramadan, you know we all make intention, inshallah, tomorrow I'll forgive Tomorrow I'll do this, tomorrow I'll do this. Tomorrow, there's no time for tomorrow. What if I die today? When is the time? The time is now. The time is, let's make the change today. In one hadith, it's, oh, what a beautiful hadith. Nabi Sallallahu says, Allah will call the hafid of the Quran, not a full, you know, we mistake. We think that on the day of Qiyamah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned all the virtues and rewards, we think it's only for the people who are full hafid of the Quran. No. It's not for the full hafid of the Qur'an. It's also for the full hafid of the Qur'an. He'll get the complete reward. But for those people who have learned some portion of the Qur'an, Allah has also promised reward. What does Allah say? Allah says on the day of Qiyamah, I'll say, Iqra, wartaqi, waratil kama kunta turatilu fi dunya, fa inna manzilataka inda akhari ayatin taqra'uha. Allah says that a person who has memorized not all of the Qur'an, a few surahs of the Qur'an, a few ayat of the Qur'an, Allah says, I'll call him forward. And Allah will say, I love the way you did all this for me. Iqra, keep praying. Wartaqi, and keep rising in Jannah. Which is why Muhadithin say, when the topic comes, how many levels and stages of Jannah are there? They say the levels of Jannah equal the number of ayat in the Quran. Because Allah says, that your level of Jannah will be according to how many ayat you memorize. If you memorize 10 ayat, you'll be on level 10. If you memorize 50, you'll be on level 50. 
So in Ramadan, if you memorize one ayat a day, how many ayat is at the end of the month? 30. So that's 30 stages raised in the hereafter. It's so simple. Waratil and keep praying. Kama kunta turatilu fi dunya, like you used to recite so melodiously in the world. Fa inna manzilata ka inda akhiri ayat in taqrawa o kama kal. And that your final stage in Jannah will be according to the ayat, will be according to the number of ayat and verses and sentences you've memorized. Let's make an effort in Ramadan to memorize as much Quran as we can. Like I said, don't put pressure on yourself to do too much. What we do is we try to do too much, then we forgive, forget, and we just drop it. Do one ayat a day and maintain this even after Ramadan. Next, recite Quran. I'll give you one hadith to show you the virtue of the Quran. Something came into our mind from the Quran. It's quite fascinating. Again, look into the Quran. The Quran is full of amazing things. Allah says, Allah is, not, Allah is introducing the month of Ramadan. I mentioned this to Muhammad yesterday. Allah talks about the month of Ramadan. And Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila. Allah says, I'm now going to introduce the month of Ramadan. Example, I'll, I'll ask, somebody has to answer now, we can't stay quiet. If you were to introduce Ramadan to a new Muslim or a non-Muslim, how would you introduce the month of Ramadan? How would you recognize, how would you introduce it? It's the month of fasting. We all say it's the month of fasting. Or it's the month of forgiveness. Or it's the month of difficulty. It's the month of taqwa. It's the month of remembering others. Allah doesn't introduce Ramadan using the month of fasting. Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, I will introduce the month of Ramadan. How? Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Allah says, my introduction to the month of Ramadan is that it's the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. Look at the status of the Qur'an. Allah has used it to introduce the month of Ramadan when He could have used fasting to introduce the month of Ramadan. Why? Because the Qur'an and Ramadan have a great nisbah and a great connection, which is why in a hadith, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when a person engages in Qur'an, and he doesn't have time to make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of his recitation of Qur'an, will give him those things which he would have made dua for, but didn't have time for, and will give him more than that. Let's make ourselves busy in Ramadan, and saying, I don't understand the Qur'an is no excuse. Saying, I can't pray Qur'an properly is no excuse. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa has said, Al-Mahiru bil-Qur'an ma'as safarati al-kirami marara That the Mahir and the expert reciter of the Qur'an Like the Hufad and the Qur'an And those who have been through the Maktab system And who now pray the Qur'an very well and fluently He says they will be with the great angels But he doesn't He, he could have said that's it And the people who don't pray Qur'an would lose hope Allah says no وَالَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ وَيَتَتَعْتَعُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقْ فَلَهُ أَجْرَانِ but the person who struggles in reading the Qur'an, he reads the Qur'an, fihi, And he struggles while praying the Qur'an. It takes him two hours to finish one para, or two hours to read half a para. One juice is very difficult for him. And he finds it difficult. Nabi Wasallam says, the first person, the expert recited, got one reward. The person who struggles and prays Qur'an gets two rewards. One reward for praying, and one reward for, like I said, one reward for thee? Effort, like I said before, what does Allah want? He just wants effort. You might not be perfect. Allah just wants you to put in the effort. Let's put in this effort today. So we have no excuse. Ramadan is the month of the Quran. And we've made it a great, forgive me for saying this, we've made it a great custom amongst ourselves. We've made Ramadan the month of bayans. We sit after Asr to Maghrib in a bayan an hour long. And the maqsad of Ramadan, Ram, Quran, the maqsad of the talk, and the purpose and the objective and the aim of the talk, the goal of the talk, was to bring us closer to the Qur'an. But they've left us no time to pray Qur'an. Which is why, alhamdulillah, the tartib I've set here, I've joined with Imam Sabazwa, we've made a tartib, we've made an arrangement. Every day after Asr Salah, only 15 minutes. And even those 15 minutes, when we talk about anything else, just on the Qur'an, and only on the last 10, last 10 surahs of the Qur'an, and surah Fatah, which we pray in every namaz. Because it's sad. Why is it sad? We pray Qur'an, we pray Surah Fatiha. How many times a day? Muhammad, 17 times a day we pray Surah Fatiha. How many people here can translate Surah Fatiha to me? You pray it 17 times, you tell a non-Muslim this, you say you're crazy. You pray something 17 times a day, every day, for 25, 30, 40, 50 years, you don't know what it means? 
Which is why we'll just spend 15 minutes after Asr, inshallah, every day, just going through these surahs and the last 10 surahs of the Quran, which we tend to pray from Alam Tara Uwala Asri till the end. Inshallah, just 15 minutes a day, and the rest of the time will be for you to pray Quran. That's a promise on my part, inshallah. But the guarantee on your part has to be that you have to start praying Quran. And we'll all, we'll all sit together, inshallah, we'll all pray Quran. And also I've written on here, which we should spend some time doing tafsir. If you don't have the time or you don't visit this masjid, the women folk at home, they listen to a bayan from another masjid, they're free to do what they want. I'm not going to force them to turn this masjid's mic on. But I mentioned the tafsir to pray. You pray the tafsir called Ma'arif al-Quran by Mufti Shafi Uthmani. We have a copy in the masjid. It's both in English and Urdu. And that tafsir is the best and the most, the easiest tafsir. The easiest tafsir for the layman. Because Mufti Shafi Uthmani, rahmatullahi, he wrote this, he didn't write this tafsir just... He didn't write it as a project. This tafsir is a collection of radio programs he carried out. So he was giving it out. He was imparting this advice for the lay people, for the people who work 9 to 5. So the language is very, he's dumbed it down a lot for all of us to understand. So we have no excuse. Even, even if you say we don't understand the Quran, we have no excuse. Ma'arif al-Quran is there. And um, please, if you want to study something, come to the ulama, come to me first, and please just tell me what you want to do, I'll tell you, because today there are many translations of the Qur'an which are, which are, Allah forgive me, saying, but they, are, they distort the message of the Qur'an. There's people, I've seen Muslims walking around with translations of the Qur'an by the Ahmadi cult, by the Qadianis. Muslims, Qadianis aren't even Muslims, but they've translated the Qur'an. And people are walking around with their translations inside their homes without knowing this is a Qadiani translation. Because we've become people of the internet today. Everything has to be bought from Amazon or eBay or something. So everything we study, that's why I've written here, a trusted tafsir, and I've given my advice at the bottom, what to pray. I'll wrap this up, it's getting late. I've also written, we should memorize and practice du'as. These du'as were recited by Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If we love Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we'll follow Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Peace Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Ura bin Mas'ud, he became radiallahu ta'ala an, he wasn't a Muslim then. He was sent by the kuffar to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he was just told, observe, observe the relationship between the Sahaba and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Urwa looked, then he returned to the kuffar and he said, you know what, I've been to the kings of the world, and I've been to the biggest superpowers of the world, but wallah, Nabi Sallallahu might be a Bedouin or a vill- and a villager, but I've never seen anybody respect their king and their ruler and their leader like they, the Sahaba respect Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says something, they're all running to do it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would spit and they take his spit in their hand and they'd rub it for barakah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do wudu and they'd sit there and they'd fight for the water from his wudu and they'd rub it over their bodies for barakah. This is the love they had for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's put this love into our lives. Every, every dua Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, before eating, after eating, before using the bathroom, after using the bathroom, in the morning, in the evening. Like I said, there is so much material available. You know, before, 100 years ago, they could have an excuse. There are not, not many printing presses, not many books available today. There's a whole, there's a massive load of books available. And Alhamdulillah, you have a ulama in Gloucester who can help you find the best books and who can help teach you, inshallah. So every day we memorize one dua and practice on one dua. By 30 days, it'll be 30 duas. 30 days, 30 duas. And even if we don't improve it during the year, next Ramadan, it'll be 31 to 60. So every year we'll keep improving, inshallah. Next, study tafsir. Yes, I've said that. We'll study tafsir. I mentioned, I've written one ayat here. And just to tell you what you understand from reading tafsir, everything I told you today about tafsir, about Shahr Ramadan, Labi Unzil Fihi Al Quran, you'll only understand it when you study tafsir. One thing I'd like to tell you about Jannah Allah says, Muttaqin, those who have taqwa. In Ramadan, what do we have to attain? Taqwa. Allah says, those who attain taqwa will enter Jannah. And Allah describes three levels of people in Jannah. Allah says, the Jannah will be split into three, three categories. Allah says, the first category of people in Jannah will be. إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ يَشْرَبُونَ مِنْ كَأْسٍ كَانَ مِزَاجُهَا كَافُورًا The pious people, the lower level of Jannah, they're still pious people, they're in Jannah. He says, they'll drink from glasses themselves. When Allah mentions the second, the, the medium level of people in Jannah, He says, وَيُسْقَوْنَ فِيهَا كَأْسًا 
Allah says those people won't drink themselves. They'll be brought things to drink. And the angels and the maids and the servants of Jannah will give it to them to drink. So on the first one, we're doing everything ourselves. On the second one, it's being brought to us. We're like kings. And on the third one, the highest people, Allah says, وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا Allah says, your Lord will give you the thing to drink himself. This is Jannah. You'd never have known this unless you read the tafsir. Enjoy, taf- enjoy the Quran by reading tafsir. That's how you learn it. Only 15 minutes a day, more than enough. By reading tafsir. A few more things. We should make an intention, especially the youngsters. I know youngsters aren't listening to this, but especially youngsters and even the adults now, we cut down on social media completely. Myself first. My parents keep telling me off using social media too much, I'm using my phone too much. Myself first. Cut down mobile phone usage. Cut down social media. It's the biggest waste of time in the world. And also the fitna in it is crazy. So we, even if it's for dini purposes, cut it down. Because... We'll open an article on Facebook or Twitter, on Instagram or something about Deen. Then, you know, on, like on YouTube, we'll see a link about a bayan. And on the side, you'll have something like a video of Dynamo or something. Then you'll go on to that. Then, uh, then you started on a bayan and you ended up on something you shouldn't be watching. That's what happens. So we cut down completely. We cut down on social media. Don't swear, argue, backbite or curse. Allah says in the Quran, مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ That then not one word is uttered except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent angels to write it down. Everything we say be written down, good or bad, will be written down by the angels. An Arabic poet says, جَرَاحَاتُ السِّنَانِ لَهَا الْتِيَامُ وَلَا يَلْتَامُ مَا جَرَحَ الْلِسَانُ He says, جَرَاحَاتُ السِّنَانِ لَهَا الْتِيَامُ If you punch somebody, or you cut somebody, or you kick somebody, or you stab somebody, they will be wounded physically and physical wounds heal, correct? If I have a wound that is a physical wound, it will correct. It leave a scar behind, but it will heal and it will become good, correct? But he says, جَرَاحَاتُ السِّنَانِ لَهَا الْتِيَامُ وَلَا يَلْتَامُ مَا جَرَحَ الْلِسَانُ He says, there are things we say from our tongue which no plaster or no cream or no ointment can ever fix. Families are broken up because of the use of this tongue. Especially in Ramadan, let's cut down this tongue. Hazrat Umar used to say, "Ma in nadim tu bis sukuti maratan, walakin nadim tu ala al kalami mirara." He says, "I've never ever regretted staying quiet, but regarding talking, it was I've regretted talking too much many times." Same with us. If we stay quiet, we won't regret anything. If you speak, you're putting yourself in a position now where you could say something wrong. Let's control our tongues in Ramadan. Protect your eyes from haram comes in the taqwa. You know Allah is watching you. Just don't do it. Avoid music, TV, movies. Same thing. Give sadaqah every day. In one hadith, Nabi Wasallam, the Sahaba when discovered Nabi Wasallam used to say that Nabi Wasallam was very generous. When Ramadan used to come, he used to become the most generous of the people. And he used to be more generous than the passing wind. When, a wind, when the wind comes, does the wind... If there was a wind in this masjid, for example, there are six steps in this masjid. And if a wind was passing through, would it only pass through five steps and leave one? No. The wind will pass through all six steps, correct? In the same way, Nabi Wasallam, by discovering Nabi Wasallam as a passing wind, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala is trying to say that Nabi Wasallam's generosity would encompass everybody. He wouldn't leave anybody without being generous to him. And I've written on here a minimum a pound a day. We all know how much we can give. If you don't, if you're not so well off, fifty p a day, not a problem. If you're better off than most, like if you're a footballer and you keep telling him a pound a day, he's earning eighty thousand pound a week. He'll be like a pound a day. He goes, I can give a pound a second. So if you have more money to give, give five pound a day. Up to you, but give sadaqah daily. If by giving fifty p a day you can do it every day, then give it every. Then do that. That's better than giving it a, than giving a pound for half the month and leaving the other month, leaving the other half. So be consistent. Do it every day. Only two more things. Every night before we sleep, we take accountability of ourselves. This is probably the most important thing. We, where we lie down and we should think, this day, today, have I done good? Have I done bad? Everything good I've done, I say, Alhamdulillah, 
I will repeat that tomorrow. Everything bad I've done, I say, Astaghfirullah, I'll change that tomorrow. Imagine if every day, if every day, your good deeds don't go up, but your bad deeds go down every day. By two, in two, three years time, you'll be faultless. If you're doing 500 bad things today, and you promise to change one bad thing every day, in one and a half years, you will become a wali of Allah. It's really that simple. Just make it, if I do something bad today, tomorrow it can't happen. I swore today, tomorrow it shouldn't happen. Self-accountability before sleep. And the last one is sleep with wudu. Everything we do, we should sleep with wudu. It comes in a hadith in Tabarani, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, that when a person sleeps with wudu, the angels make dua for him and the angels say, Allah forgive him because he has slept in a state of wudu. Allah forgive him because... He has slept in the state of wudu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to carry out these deeds. To use this checklist, like I said, I've made 1100 copies. Alhamdulillah, 300 are going up to the schools. Mufti Abdullah, said, Mufti Ismail, so I've asked for copies. I've been giving them out. Tomorrow, inshallah, after Jummah, we'll be giving out in all the masajid, in all the madrasas as well. If you want to copy, if you want more than one copy, take as many as you want, inshallah. If we need to print more, then I'll print more in Ramadan. It won't be an issue, inshallah. We also need people tomorrow to hand them out after Jummah. You know, some of us haven't donated financially for it. So you can take two ways you can participate in it. By acting upon it and taking one. And the other way, one, the other way you can do is taking one and giving it to somebody else. If I take it and I give it to you and you start praying Surah Yasin every day, I get the reward for every Surah Yasin you pray. I get the reward for every Subhanallah and Astaghfirullah. If you get one tree in Jannah, I have nothing to do with it. I'm sleeping. I'll also get a tree in Jannah. Let's participate in this way. Tomorrow, inshallah, we need people who can help give these out outside the masajid. If anybody can help, we greatly appreciate it. And the last message for the women folk. I said we have to change before Ramadan. And let's make the most of our time in Ramadan. We know we have, you have cooking to do. Your husbands and your sons are very demanding. But finish your cooking before Ramadan. And even the men, I'm telling you, you're here now, and even the men listening at home, and those who may, inshallah, receive the recording of this, that don't put pressure on your wife to cook too much in Ramadan. They also have a Ramadan, they also have a Jannat. Jannat isn't just for men, it's for, for women as well. Let them earn their Jannah as well. Women spend too much time in the kitchen in Ramadan. They spend too much time in the kitchen. If you have anything to make, your spring rolls, samosas, whatever, you have to make it before Ramadan. Freeze it before Ramadan, doesn't make a difference anyway. And the worst thing when it comes to Eid, for Eid, everyone wants to bake a cake. And the problem is, if I want to prepare for Ramadan, I can prepare for Ramadan before Ramadan. But if I prepare for Eid, what's the time before Eid? Ramadan. And the funny thing is, before Eid, it's the most important days of Ramadan, the last 10 days of Ramadan. When I'm supposed to worship Allah even more. And women are too busy cake, baking cakes. I'm not saying no, you can do it, but do it at a time where it's not necessary. You know, you can pass your time without having to fast and without... Doing without praying your Quran, keep your cooking outside of Ramadan for as much. Even your even biscuits, whatever you make for Eid, make it before Ramadan. It's not going to make a difference anyway. Just make it before Ramadan. Make the most of your time in Ramadan. And one thing, very practical. Like I said today, we have more practical advice. We we have a very bad habit in Ramadan of wasting food. All of us a very bad habit of wasting food. Don't eat. Don't cook more than you're going to eat. You're going to eat some and the rest is going to go into a dustbin. It's a very bad habit of ours. Very bad habit. I'll tell you what happens. We cook so much food. I will say this food can't be wasted. We'll say, I can't waste this food. So we'll put it in an ice cream tub. Put it in the fridge or the freezer. A week passes. Nobody eats it. After a week it goes in the bin. It's the same routine every day in every house. We have to, minim- we have to minimize the waste in Ramadan. And last thing, last thing before we finish is let's not let this Ramadan go past without changing and that we live a life of regret. One ayat of the Qur'an, Allah says, كَلَّا إِذَا دُكَّتِ الْأَرْضُ دَكَّا دَكَّا وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَالْمَلُكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا وَجِيءَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمْ Allah says, the people will come, Allah will come, the angels will come. Saf dar saf, in rows. وَجِيءَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمْ Allah says, that day I'll bring Jahannam forth. That day man will see with his eyes and that day man will say, Oh no, I understand. Allah will say, it's too late to understand. It's too late to, man will apologize. Allah says, it's too late to apologize. You can't. You can't. Time has gone. 
And this is the ayah. Man will live with regret on that day and say, If only I had prepared something for today. What will he say? Everybody will say this. If only I had prepared something for today. Like Allah says in the Quran, Hatta ida ja'a. When all of you will come to Allah and Allah will show you your accounts, you will tell Allah, send us back. Send us back. Give us a chance. One more chance. Second para Allah says, Allah, one more chance. Give me one more chance, Allah. One more chance. <coughs> Allah will say, no, this isn't time for regret. This isn't time for regret. Hazrat Ali used to say, فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْيَوْمَ عَمَلٌ وَلَا حِسَابٌ وَغَدًا حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَمَلٌ Hazrat Ali used to say, prepare yourself for the hereafter and make yourself a man of the hereafter. Don't make yourself a part of this materialistic world. Why? Because in this world today, you can do amal. You can do amal and there'll be no punishment. Allah doesn't send the angels down with their whips if you miss namaz today. But he says tomorrow will be dangerous because tomorrow Allah will have his whip. Wala amal. But tomorrow you can't say, Allah, give me time to pray one more subhanallah. Let's not let this Ramadan go past that we regret after Ramadan. I didn't make the most of this Ramadan. I've gone on too long. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I request all the brothers to take these checklists home to make the most of it, to use it, and to make dua for all those who have prepared it. And for all those who have distributed, help financially, whichever way, help with du'as, you can also help with du'as, you can help with distribution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all our sins and give us all the ability to make the most of the month of Ramadan. Wa akhiru da'awana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanahu wa alhamdulillahi subhanahu wa alhamdulillahi alhamdulillahi ashadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiru wa tuwi. We do one quick du'a before we leave. Bismillahi rahmani rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك من عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما سعادك من عبدك ونبيك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله جز الله عنا نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم بما هو أهله سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون السلام عليكم